This is Thriving Chiropractors, where chiropractors supporting chiropractors and talking to chiropractors that are thriving beyond the four walls of their practice. This is Dr. Arson Cohen with Thriving Chiros, and uh, we are very lucky today. We got a two-for-one special right here. Dr. Joe Clarino and Dr. Debs Roan here. Uh, very grateful they came out today. They've been a, a mentor to a lot of chiropractors for a long time. And uh, this is going to be such a great podcast that we're going to be able to share today with you all. And, you know, what we do with Thriving Chiros is we want to take chiropractors not just surviving, we want to help them to thrive. And so, you know, grateful to have two just very successful chiropractors, but also like I like y'all as more just than chiropractors. I like y'all as business people. Oh, and, I, and I think that's cool, right? I think that's a big transition to make going from a chiropractic clinic to being a business owner. Very big. Even if you own the business, you still own a job a lot. It's <laughs> chiropractors. You guys actually have own businesses. And, uh, you know, I think my first opening question to both y'all is looking back over the time you guys, when you graduated, what would you share as some of the big pivotal moments or decision you made? Or it could even have been like a book you read or a moment of time where you really transform that mindset though to go from owning a job to owning a business hmm. i don't know who wants to start with that but I, for me i mean 26 years in practice there's been a lot of things that have happened over the years um, experience will definitely give you the wisdom but i would say one of the biggest things that happened with us was covid so for years um well, once COVID happened, let's just put it this way, we know everything shut down. They say we're going to flatten the curve, and we knew it was a bunch of baloney. Um, and that's where we said, you know what? It's time for us to shift gears and step in front of this rather than being behind it. And we immediately went out and started doing Facebook interviews. We had medical doctors on. We had uh, lab owners talking about the PCR test and how it's being done and, and all of the things that were happening that people were thinking were truths. Uh, we were exposing them. And I wouldn't say it was exactly doing that that was pivotal. I would say the pivotal thing was really all of the things that we did prior to that. So we created a culture in our practice and people, we were teaching people how to be their own advocates and teaching people that the power that made this body heals the body. So when this came, people were kind of you know, they were like, okay, this is a real thing, it's a virus. And when all of the misinformation was coming at them and we started putting ourselves out there for people to, to see real information, they already trusted us mm -hmm. and they shared it. And I think that was massive, not only to, um, you know, you can't just wait until something happens. It's like praying to God after something is already going on. You know, you got to create the relationship first. So relationships were key and communication was key. So when the, the world kind of fell to hell in the handbasket, we were there. How many interviews did you do? Oh, gosh. Uh, but we probably did 18, 20, 20, 20 something. Yeah, we did a lot. Are you all still doing them or has that taken a pause? I took no, a pause. Yeah. Somebody got really busy and <laughs> stopped doing it. <laughs> I know, and I think that's great to be proactive, though, from the standpoint of like, hey, it happens. Because well, what was the first interview? Oh, gosh, really early on. Like, I would say a couple of weeks after the shutdown. Wow, so yeah. still March. Yeah, and we had to really be careful about. Um, the words we use and how we, we like we were really dancing around things and we never got shut down by Facebook um, but we were able to kind of show people information without being flagged and uh, like she said it was I was blown away by how many people leaned into that mm -hmm. which not even from our community but just around the country like people leaned into it. we had thousands of people on there every week it was pretty wild and and the information was real and, and it had it had pertinence to it right and so uh, the thing about that is it not only gave us more strength to go back to the office and, f you know, fight the fight, but it gave our team, mm -hmm. like our team would listen to it every week. And then when we would go there and we would go there with armor and excitement and intention, and then all of a sudden the patients felt it that we were, we were the, uh, Franson says this, which was really cool. He was like, Stephen Franson. Um, he was like, buffaloes run into the storm. Everybody else runs away from it. And he's like, and that was the probably the thing that we really pivoted. We ran into it instead of running from it. And then what were some of the, I mean, if you look back, because to me it's like action. A, a lot of chiropractors say they want to do things and they should do things, right? But you guys did it. Yeah. And you did it in March, which is obviously when everything started right. to happen. You took action behind that. You're very purpose-driven chiropractors. You know, I know you all very well. Like, what were some of the results from that? Do you guys have any, like, tangible results or even like mindset shifts where just transform the practice or your life as a whole? 
Well, economically, if you look at it from an economic perspective, we dropped probably about 30% when it hit, um, it went down. Uh, but I just kept telling, you know, our team and I kept telling all the other clinics and in, in our, in our franchise was like, hey, this is a slingshot move, right? Mm. This is how it works. Like you pull back to let go. And then once you let go, hang on, because everybody else is pulling back to let, to let go. And there's a difference to pull back, let go, to pull back, hold on, right? Mm. And when we did that with the intention of like, when everything catches up and it turns, we're gonna be way in front of everybody else on the back end, and it, we were. like, And then we shot up and our numbers went through the roof yeah. even more. We only stayed down for a short period of time. But the cool thing is not only to the chiropractors that you know look to us for advice and mentorship, but we had a lot of interns in the practice too. Wow. Yeah, and some of the things that we were hearing from these docs and the interns about what they learned through that, like that was incredible because we do these things to make a difference, right? So to have these docs go out into their practices and and see what happens when you create momentum like that is really impactful. I, think, you know, I mean, to your point, what you were saying earlier is like you don't have to wait for a pandemic to happen to create momentum. Mm -mm. So like young doctors right now thinking, you know, well, when the next thing happens, I'm going to do that or start now yeah. in doing these things to build that culture, build the community, start generating momentum. I mean, you know, we've all been in practice for a while now. So how we would communicate what we would do is probably a little different than somebody who's within their first year or two. Um, and for them, it's just start now. Yeah. What, about, what about for you, Dr. Joe? What, what would you say, like, something pivotal, pivotal in the last, like, you know, 20 years of your career that, or a decision you made or a book you read or somebody said something? So for me, it was a little, you know, that was a, one of my favorite parts of my career, like, as, as being in chiropractic 26 years. But I think personally what made my shift in, in chiropractic was a, a couple things. One, um, I read a book called Built to Sell, and that changed my perspective on business. I was like, wow, I'm doing this backwards. I never understood the idea of starting with the end in mind and then working backwards, right? I always started like we were just doing what we were doing with no real goal, no one, no real outside of like, what's the big idea here? Like, yes, it's a practice, it's a business, it's a, it's a business. And at the end of the day, you have to look at it from a business perspective. Yes, you're treating people and helping people, but at some point in time, this is going to either be sold or transferred over or doing something. And I never thought of it that way. I just always thought of it like build it. And so yeah, that really- We to give, love, and serve out of our abundance and we were running on pure energy. Pure energy, <laughs> pure energy. Um, but I think this, the thing that really got me was I realized that I was trying to do everything from an outside source and I realized it was there's nothing on the outside that's gonna change your practice except you. And once I started to change me and I started looking deep inside of who I was and the, the way I viewed the world and the things that I um, was mechanically almost working in towards it, like towards my life, wasn't the answer to the success. And it was the apps opposite of that totally. And once I started working on me and we started working on us better, then we became better humans. And then I think the next thing that really switched everything was then I took that to my team. Mm. So once I realized that we're in the business of raising great people and inside of that, your team members have to be phenomenal. And the only way they're phenomenal is you help them get there. Yeah. Now you have to hire the right people to do the right job, but at the end of the day, you have to hire exceptional people. And then you pour into them and they become outrageous. Yeah, that's interesting. We had a uh, we do these calls. These they're called CEO roundtable calls. And we do them for our company for all the different clinics because we try to get our chiropractors to think like you are the CEO of your clinic. Hmm. I may be the CEO of Corrective Chiropractic, but you are the CEO of your specific location. Right, yep. And um, you know we had Larry Ryback, who's the CEO right now of Jim and X Barbecue, oh, ex like cool. COO of True Food Kitchen, uh, PF Chang's. And what was interesting was. He was talking to us, actually. The thing he talked to us about was team first. Mm -hmm. Like, pour into your team. Because you could try to pour into your clients and your customers, but if your team's unhappy and miserable with their job, it doesn't matter. He's like, so team first, client second, finance is third. Mm -hmm. And if you go through that model, like... You'll always win. You will always win. And that's been the theme, by the way, that of the last interviews we've done is getting into that inside-out mindset. Mm -hmm. right. right? Most chiropractors... They think outside in. What are what are some things y'all do though to work on yourselves, like from personal development or to grow from this? Because you you didn't start like this, of course, when you graduate school, right? We all probably had poverty, like lack mindsets. So how did y'all transform that? Um, I mean, gosh, it really just started 
expanding outside. I mean, you think you have the answer to everything, like when you're a kid, right? Nobody knows anything better than I do. I, mom and dad are dumb. They don't know anything. Like, you get to the, those teenage years, and the same thing happened outside of school. You know, it's like we can do this on our own. And one of the things that we came to realize is that mentorship was massive. There's other people who have done it before we did. We were always told, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants. Those giants have done things that we don't understand. And when we understood where our deficits were, like he said, but also learning how to communicate. Communication is key. And in school, you learn how to be a student. But it doesn't teach you how to be a doctor or how to communicate not only to your team, but to your patients. And if you're not doing the things that it takes to understand why you've gotten to where you are, what it takes to get people well, how to lead them to get to that place, then it's kind of like you're, you're standing on your own little island. So if I look at your... Uh if I look at your Audible, your podcast, your Instagram right now, like who's coming up? Like who are the mentors? Like the people you're listening to, reading? Like who oh are your people gosh. right now? So everybody from Ed Milet to Joe Dispenza. I mean, we're talking about things like spiritual things to business, uh, listening to entrepreneurs like uh, Alex Hermosi. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that are doing really great things. And I think also chiropractically, we get this very limited mindset. You know, like I said, give, love, and serve out of your abundance. And a lot of chiropractors will leave school and open their little practice and kind of get stuck in that. And you don't get to have momentum if you don't get a start somewhere. And so you have to go out and... I don't listen, I love music, but the only time I listen to music is when it's playing in my home while I'm cooking or if I'm actually relaxing by my pool, but we are listening to podcasts and we're listening to books. It's never ending. Somebody said years ago, give it, what it start, like two years out, things get easy, then five years out, things get easier, 10 years out, things get easier. It doesn't stop. The learning never stops. <laughs> yeah, man, I think for, I think at least for me, it's like, it gets easier because I get more clear on who I am as a yes. person. For and sure. the things that matter to me change, mm -hmm. where I start caring less about what other people think and more so it's like, really what matters is how do my kids look at me as a father? Yeah. And how does my wife look at me as a husband? And, and if that is winning at a 10 out of 10, all the other stuff, like, doesn't matter. it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> it's so true. And, and I love that y'all are listing. I love chiropractic more than anything in the world. And this is, I'm very grateful I found this profession. But I love that y'all are not listi listing, like, chiropractors too as well. You're listing, like, real business. Built to Sell was one of my favorite books, by the way, and that really transformed my life also. And uh, when I go, y'all are in selling mode right now, I'm in buying mode, and when I go look at chiropractors, I ask, you know, is there an associate in there? And do y'all have recurring revenue? Mm -hmm. If it's pay per visit and there's one doctor, I won't buy that clinic, right? Yep. right? And that's exactly what you're describing, is like, you guys got through that mindset, like, so for you, Joe, like, who are you? Who are you listening to right now, man? Who's on your Audible podcast, everything? Um, the same same stuff. We listen to a lot of the same things. Um, I listen to Edna a lot all the time. I'm always listening to different audio books, listen to autobiographies, right down to uh, business stuff, to marketing things. Anything I get my hands on that's in, like, I'm eclectic in that sense. Like, one day I want to listen to marketing, next day I want to listen to something, you know, spiritual. There, there's that one book that you talk about all the time. Um, I think it's a Jewish guy out of New York business. Oh, uh, uh, Harry... Um, uh, um, Bernstein, Bernstein, um, not Bernstein. That's uh, I can't think of his name right now. It's uh, it was he's the manager of Elvis Presley in Sinatra. Wow! It's what it's my favorite. We'll find this and put it in the show notes. Favorite yeah. audio book. I can't think of the book right now. It's we'll, the, we'll put it in yeah. the show notes. We'll find. Uh, it. it was great, and it was one of my favorite audio books because he actually does it. He actually narrates it, and he goes through all these things. And the thing about the book, the takeaway out of the book was there was constantly walls. And, uh, and things in his way that he had no idea how to overcome, but he just did it mm -hmm. and he kept doing it. And when we first opened, we didn't know the walls were in front of us. We would run a hundred miles an hour, hit the wall and then just climb the wall until we got over it, mm -hmm. regardless of how big it was. I think the difference today is there's so much information in front of you that you understand the size of the wall and it scares you. And therefore fear stops you from climbing the wall. We were too ignorant to understand the size of the wall. Thank so, God. Thank God. <laughs> no, no, that, that was a great thing. And so we just climb the wall, get down, run 100 miles an hour, hit the next wall, climb the wall, get over it. And today, I think everybody's looking for, well, how do I get around the wall? How do I get under the wall? How do I? What's the easiest way? What's the easiest way? And I listened to something the other day. My buddy uh, Cliff Fisher sent it to me. Um, it was the University of Duke's uh, women's basketball team coach. She said um, she talks about great and put this in the notes as well. It's called Hard Easy. 
right? And she said, you know, everybody thinks when you get out of school, life's gonna get easier. Everybody thinks when you get a job and make X amount of money, life's gonna get easier. She's like, everybody thinks that life gets easier. And she's like, let me explain something to you clearly. It doesn't. She's like, you just learn how to do harder, better. You learn how to do harder, better. And she's like, and guess what happens? When you learn how to do harder, better, harder things come because you're ready. And then you do harder, harder, better. And then when you get harder, harder, better, it becomes almost impossible comes to you. And that's how you change the world. Mm. uh, One one thing I love and one of the advice I always give young chiropractors, I think endurance racing is important. Like just from the standpoint of it builds muscle memory, builds endurance, it shows you can do things. And David Goggins, you guys know who he is, he always talks about the cookie jar. Like if you do a marathon, that's a cookie that goes in the cookie jar. Now you know you can do it, right? Like Mm -hmm. you see a hundred a day, you do it a few times, you're like, a hundred days, not that bad. I can do it. And they're just cookies that you're like constantly throwing like in that cookie jar. You know, one thing, I'm glad y'all are both here because I wanted to ask y'all this question. There's a lot of chiropractors that are dating other chiropractors. <laughs> and, and, and they're thinking about going into practice together. Oh God, I could talk about I this would, for three hours. Yeah, so we have like four minutes left, <laughs> but I would just love first off, like do you recommend it? And if so, what rules or boundaries or like what needs to happen first in order to make it be successful? Because obviously like most people say family first, right? Yeah. What, what do y'all say to this? Okay, get two minutes. <laughs> two words, yeah. expectations and agreements. You have to talk about what, what does this look like? Where are we going? Like he talked about reverse engineering. It's the same thing. What do you want your family to look like? What do you want your practice to look like? And then who's great at what things or who can accomplish what things and agree that you're going to stay in this lane. Yeah. You're like, we got to a point in practice, like we were just all over the place. And then I was like, okay, listen, you run the back, you run the docks. I will do whatever you say. I will run the front. You do whatever I say. So when we got really clear about who was doing what, that's when we really stopped arguing and started communicating better and started building teams rather than breaking them down because we were running two ends against the middle. I would say something to the team. He would say something to the team. They'd be two different things. And then they're like, like who do I listen to? So confusion does not help anybody. Well, two, if, if two chiropractors came up to you right now and asked you if they should do it, would you recommend it if they created roles and responsibilities with each other? It depends on the, the couple. Yeah. It does. There's been some couples that we've advised to go do your own thing and other couple, and one should be in a practice, like working for somebody else or in a franchise. Another one should be, you know, as a rock star and they're, they're a race car driver and they should be running their own practice. Mm-hmm. You have to know you, you have to know where your strengths lie. You have to know your relationship and then you can go from there. But if you don't have all the pieces of the puzzle, you're just kind of throwing, you know, darts in the dark. What do you say to that? 100% agree on that. I think the number one thing I see is two women, uh, a wife and a husband, end up being one doctor, not two doctors. Mm. And so you have two people trying to do the same job as one person, and that's literally a quarter productive of what one person should actually be doing. It's the, it's it's compounded. It's not the wrong way, not the right way. And what happens, like to her point, is when you separate those and have distinctive key performance indicators, KPIs around what is my role here in this practice? What is your role in this practice? And where is the organization of this business? And how are we controlling this organization? Whether it's three people or 100 people, it doesn't make a difference. You have to treat it as if. And once you do that and have clarity to her point, then you have metrics and things to measure your success of what you're doing. If not, you think you're doing it. I cannot tell how many chiropractors are like, oh, my CVA is this and my PVA is this and they tell me, and then we run the numbers and they're like, no way. I'm like, way, because your perception is people are staying. Your perception is mm. that you're doing, it's until you have a number, it's a perception, numbers don't lie, right? And that's the way, and I always say one's a stat, two's a story. So once you start learning that, you really get into understanding what your business is and isn't. And the numbers will, if you lean into the numbers, then it's never like you did or you didn't do this. It's not like, okay, why are the numbers looking like this and how do we make them better? So you're not pointing fingers at one another anymore. So it it can save a marriage for sure and a partnership. It probably say, yeah, like partnerships and even like just business relationships. at every business that I've ever studied, they they are clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Who's in charge of marketing? Who's in charge of finance? Who's in charge of rela- community relations? Like, a- and everything falls down on like these people, right? And when there's not, well, I think what happens oh. is in a small business, you get you don't think it's a hat. 
Yeah. But it's a physical hat that you put on. Like if I walk out of the adjusting room, I take the doctor hat off and I'm going into marketing, it's a marketing hat. And then once you switch the hat, now you're switching the intention, you're switching the outcome, you're switching the purpose, you shift that. But everybody mixes it together and tries to make a special soup out of nothing but junk and you, you're not gonna do that. You have to be distinctive about it. And once you clear that out, and it's hard to understand that, it's hard to, it's hard to grasp that mechanism but once you do, it's like anything else, you gotta lap it and lap it and lap it. And once it, once it, sit, it sits and seeds, it becomes a, a something that you will never veer from because it gives you stability, it gives you clarity, it gives you confidence in where you're moving and what you're doing next. And, and then it gives, it gives clarity to a relationship. That's what, and that's the biggest thing. What, um, so my last question, y'all, and Dr. Joe, you're gonna have to go first because now we need, so it gives Dev a few seconds to think about it now. But it's 1995. Dr. Sid Williams handing you your diplomas, and uh, the 2024 version though of yourselves on the other side of the stage, and that 2024 version, 2024 version gets to give a piece of advice to that 1995 young kid graduate over there. What is he telling that person? Um, get your ego out of the way. Number one, um, what you think you are, you aren't. Right. Number two, find out who you are. I think what I thought I was it wasn't who I was. There was things in there that I was, but the perception of who I wanted to be, I was living a lie. And once I started to realize the truth of who I was, and I started leaning into my god gift talents and geniuses that I've been given, and I started to express those things, I started impacting people further and further and further away. Um, the greatest thing that I think I've done in this profession that's given me the most reward, yes, helping people every day has been awesome, but it's helping the next generation has probably been the biggest reward that we've got out of it is like knowing that somewhere, somehow things we've said, things we've coached on, things we've trained on is a ripple somewhere happening. And that's really cool because this is an amazing profession and people don't realize that everybody wants it. And we're too, too small sometimes to realize what we have. And I think if this profession just stopped and paused and looked around what the message of the world is right now, we are sitting on the greatest thing out there and no one gets it and everybody wants it and it's our job to scream from the treetops exactly what it is and what we have. That is beautifully said. What about you, Dr. Dunn? Drop the mic. I, I mean, seriously. How do I finish, uh, how do I go from there? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just, no, it's not, I mean, with that said, just know it's not about you and don't take things personally. You know, let everything you do be in an attempt to do and be better so you can serve in a better way. And that means don't just be that, like I was that mushy, gushy, loving heart that I would give it all away. But understand, if you give it away, then you're not going to have more to give. So so always be building yourself, learning who you are. Um, you know, I mean, just do that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you guys again for doing this. Thank today. you, man. Uh, I love seeing This you. is Thriving Kairos right here. And we're going to put the, some of the books and the audibles, things in the show notes for you guys. And hopefully you can take these nuggets and, and really dive deep into what it means, what Dr. Joe and Dr. Deb said. So thank you guys again. And thank you. Enjoy the rest of season one. Thank you.